If you have two and a half years off of just travel where you don't have to work and you're basically just feeling any desire that you want to do, you get bored of that. You've had your fun, you're relaxed, and now you're like, okay, I have a problem here. Like, I am bored. <laughs> what was your next step and how did you get back into starting another business? Or Hi, and welcome to the Entrepreneur Organization Business Podcast. I am your host, Lynn Pedetti. Now, my guest today is Brendan Tarazzi, a lifestyle entrepreneur who is the founder of Sea Cliff House, a wedding venue, and OHS and Alert Force, which are education and training organization within the OHS space. Now, Brendan has also been a member of EO Sydney for over eight years, and I feel really lucky to be in the same community with him where we get to surround ourselves with the other 200 successful entrepreneur members in Sydney and nearly 17,000 members around the world. Now, in today's episode, you're going to be discovering the challenge of retiring too early. That's right. Most business owners dream of the day they don't have to work hard anymore, sell up and retire early. But this could be a challenge for us. So I'm so glad that I was able to learn from Brendan so that I can avoid facing this same challenge. And I know you will be glad too. Please join me in welcoming Brendan. How are you, Brendan? Good, Lynn. Thanks for having me on the show. Brendan, please share with us one of your most memorable challenges that you had to overcome while you've been in business. Right. Well, there's always uh, little challenges coming up in business, as you know. Um, but I'm I'm sort of casting my mind back to when I was in my 20s and my first major business was a translation agency. So I started that in like 1992. I, at the time, I was playing in bands and I'm like, I'll just start this little side hustle um, until I get famous playing in music. Music never happened. The business took off. Um, and I went from, um, I was doing these like, it was the, the recession in the early 90s and I was going around the rocks and I was knocking on doors saying would you like a Japanese sign to you know bilingual sign for tourists and that sort of thing so fast forward about oh that business went for about 11 or 12 years um so I developed it from this signage company into like a multilingual uh translation agency but I didn't know how to delegate at that point in my 20s I did everything myself so it was like the classic kind of entrepreneur where you're like pulling all nighters you got it was very deadline driven as well and I kind of basically by by the time I was in my late 20s I was like so stressed out that like I had um, dermatitis on my face and like just pushed it way way too hard and um, I was making a lot of money but the stress of the whole thing uh, led me to burnout Mm. And with and with the burnout, um, I eventually just gave up the business because I'd had enough. And um, I sold the business for a couple of times earnings, which was okay. I was happy to be out. Um, but the challenge uh, that I wanted to share with you is that, so I would have been in my early 30s when I sold and I, my wife and I had just got married and... Um, we went out on this fabulous adventure for two and a half years, traveling around through Asia and over to South America and India. But the challenge was when I came back, I like I was actually, I was probably about 33, um, 34, and I went far out. I've got to start again. I'm like way too young to retire. And um, the challenge was getting going again. So that took quite a few years to you know, because I, I remember coming back and like all my friends, I felt like their careers had advanced, whereas I'd just been stagnant, traveling, having fun. And then I felt this kind of challenge to start a new business and start again from scratch. Wow. I never really thought about that, you know, because I mean, a lot of our dreams as an entrepreneur is to kind of retire and just relax and never have to worry about business again once you kind of, you know, hit that yeah. start the business. But We never really would know. I mean, I've never sold a business at all and sit around to know the next challenge would be to feel idle. So what was causing that feeling? Like, were you, what were you thinking before you retire? And then what really happened during the period that you you kind of, you know, retired? So like I would argue that if you have two and a half years off of just travel where you don't have to work and you're basically just feeling any desire that you want to do, you get bored of that. 
you actually do get bored of it because it's not it's kind of extreme in another way so like I described in the translation agency when I was like super stressed and I got to burnout that's that's one end and then I kind of went to the other extreme where I'm like doing nothing and I'm get to the point where I'm twiddling my thumbs going oh I'm actually a bit bored now um what do I do next and then I didn't truly appreciate how hard it was to build up a successful business until I'd let it go and so that was the that was the challenge then to go okay I'm um you know I'm at a zero start as far as the business goes and what am I going to do okay so what did you do so I mean like you you've had your fun, you're relaxed. And now you're like, okay, I have a problem here. Like I am bored. <laughs> what was your next step? And how did you get back into starting another business or getting that motivation? And, and even just maybe you've lost some knowledge. How did you get all that back? Yeah. So it was a bit of trial and error. So like we spent a couple of years doing, um, we started a couple of fashion labels. Um, so that was like, some ideas that we saw overseas and we went, hey, we could we could actually do this. So we were doing, um, we did a men's label, which wasn't so successful, but we did a, a women's label called Betty and John that we used to sell at Paddington Markets and Bondi. And um, and that really took off as far as, um, you know, it was great pocket money. We were, some weeks we were taking four or five grand at the markets. And that, but it wasn't really a business that we like, in 2006, we had our first child. So it was kind of not conducive to families because you had to work every weekend and everything. So around about that time, I started, uh, I met someone who was the husband of a, f- a friend of Amanda's, who's my wife. And uh, he had this idea about um, napping in the workplace. And there was this company in New York that had um, created these sleep pods and and so we took a chance on that. We we jumped on a plane and went to New York and got the rights for this sleeping pods called Metronaps and brought it to Australia. And that was kind of the beginning of, the, I guess, my next um, career in business. Okay. So I'm just curious, you know, being an entrepreneur for like that 11 or 12 years in that business and then you had that time off, when you came back to starting a new business, was it more of a problem of like which out of all these opportunities I can see and I, you know, cause once you're an entrepreneur, you can see a lot of um, things that you could do. Is it kind of filtering through which is the best or is it actually like, I have no idea what I, what I should do. Yeah. I, I mean, I've always been one to roll the dice. So uh, I just kind of followed my intuition and went, Oh, this looks pretty good. This looks exciting. And um, jumped on in that sleeping pod business actually ultimately failed in the sense that we, Close that, but we um, and during that time we'd, we'd um, secured some third party funding, like an app from an angel investor, um, and that was that sleeping business was kind of the, um, I guess, the start of my registered training organisation, Alert Force, which is still running today. So it's kind of like you get into things they don't work, and then you go, shit, I've taken this money from somebody, I've got to, I've got to find a way to make this thing successful. Um, and that's what we did. We we found a little, by starting that business, that didn't work out, but we identified an opportunity um, around training, um, training truck drivers in how to manage their sleep. And that was kind of the um, the beginning of the health and safety training business. Okay. So I'm just curious with the first business uh, that you kind of made mistakes in terms of your like, you didn't know how to delegate, you did it all. What lessons did you learn from that that made your, you know, the Oasis business more successful? Um, well, I I guess I learned to hire staff, so that that helped. I had a I had a business partner in the beginning um, of that business, which didn't work out. So we we split. Um, but again, it's always a silver lining, right? Like you have these challenges, and then you can either go when things don't go your way, you can either go, oh shit, it's all over. Or you can go, what's the silver lining in this and and make the most of that opportunity. So that early partnership um, breakup turned into me becoming um, the majority shareholder in that new company and the angel investor um, stopped being my angel investor and it became my business partner. And we had a, an amazing um, run for probably five or six years until he left. So 
Now it's just me, Lynn. <laughs> which, awesome. I, which, which, yeah. I'm quite, which I'm quite happy about. That was uh, <laughs> that was another challenge, another big challenge I had in 2016 when um, we we got into a thing called uh, Vet Fee Help, which was very big in the paper. It was a government, federal government scheme where um, uh, they, you know, you were able to train people, and the government funded it. And then the legislation changed. They halfway through being advanced all this money and we'd tried to expand to, to capitalize and it didn't work out for us so we had to put that business into voluntary administration and then we came out in 2017 with a thing called a docker arrangement um which basically allows you to trade on um it forgives the debts you pay off a certain percentage of them and then you trade on so that was that was quite a uh it was quite a a challenging period for me, but it kind of it set me up for what I'm doing today because during that period from say 2010 to 2016, Alert Force was my only business. And when I had that sort of voluntary administration thing, I'd already started diversifying my income streams because I realized that if something happens to income stream A and things in business can turn around bloody fast, like either for good or for bad. Um, so that gave me the idea that rather than having one source of main income, I would diversify and and split up into a few different businesses. Um, and this, I've now got three main businesses. And the sum of those businesses now eclipse the profits, eclipse what Alert Force was doing in its heyday. Mm. So I'm just curious, like this raises up another challenge that I've come across, which is um, I get the whole point of having diversification, right? But when it comes to diversifying in businesses, like how do you split your time? Because even running one company is hard enough, let alone a few businesses. So, you know, how do you overcome that kind of challenge of having to wear different hats for different businesses? I think the uh, going back to that earlier point about not being able to delegate, that's something I've now learned how to do. I can delegate. So I don't work in any, I don't work on the coalface in any of the businesses. So I'm only, I'm on working on the businesses. So I do the stuff that I enjoy doing what I'm good at, but I'm not picking up the phone and I'm not day to day, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I work day to day, but I'm not in the businesses day to day. Okay. How about when you're starting out in the business, would you have had to be more hands-on and then you kind of stepped out after? And then would you say you would only do kind of one business and get established before you start another one, right? Yeah. Well, Alert Force was the um, the training business that's kind of funded these other two businesses. So Alert Force um, made a lot of profits for about five years. And then um, the way that we were structured with my business partner meant that we were actually a um, it was a unit trust, which meant we had to distribute all the profits out of the business. So with those profits, I put them into property and um, the business also bought a domain name, ohs.com.au. Um, so they're kind of like one of the properties I bought um, turned into a wedding venue. So we bought it as a family holiday home and then it kind of morphed. And now it's like this really successful wedding venue on the South Coast called Seacliff House. And um, ohs.com.au, um, that took about five years for me to work out how to make money out of it. That's my favourite business, Lynn, because uh, no, absolutely no staff, all online, all automated, and it just it's open 24 hours a day um, selling courses. So, Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I, was talking, I was thinking back at your Seacliff uh, business as well. It just looks amazing, all the people, all the couples that get married there. That's a really, really cool as well so yeah I mean what amazes me is that you your ability to actually um you know work on different types of businesses in different industry it's like how do you kind of because I know when I'm even the even when I launch a business that's kind of like uh coming off from the same business let's say a marketing agency and then I pivot out into maybe like a video production it's it's still aligned and yet it's hard and what you do is it's kind of completely different kind of spaces sometimes so like how did you uh, yeah how do you overcome that so they they all have the same theme and that's like coming up with an idea and then turning your idea into something tangible mm -hmm. so that's the common thread like it, it's creativity so what I think 
I, what I, I enjoy doing is being creative. So coming up with ideas and then actually from a, a thought, then making it a reality. And so that all the, all the businesses that follow the same format, they start with an idea and then um, they turn into something else. So I, yes. I also do quite a lot of um, uh, residential building as well. So that's been another little side career that I've had over the years where I um, I really enjoy building building property and or doing, uh, I work with my wife doing, she does the interior design, I work on the building and that's been fun as well, very creative. Ah, I really love the way you've kind of explained it. It's like you're still sticking to your strength and your genius, which is kind of coming up with idea, problem solving and making it kind of happen. And then this is where you kind of offload to your team, create the processes and have it run so that you are you're technically not kind of stretching yourself because you're not trying to do 10 million hats. It was only the first business that you felt a lot more stretched. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the alert force, I I worked in that day to day for like from 2006 through to when we had that voluntary administration event and that thing where I effectively got kicked out of the business. Um, that that was my juncture point where I go, okay, I've got to let go here because things out of your control can happen and, I, you know, you have to enjoy life along the way. So. Mm-hmm. Well, talk about enjoying life. You call yourself a lifestyle entrepreneur. So what does that mean? And yeah, I have another follow up question straight after that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for me, it just means having time, really, time and health. And so I'd say health is probably the most important thing in life, like because if you don't have your physical and mental health, you're absolutely no good to anyone around you. So um you know, like your family, you're no good to your family if you're if you're not healthy. So that's been a real focus for me, keeping in good health um, and just having time, time to enjoy things, time, the flexibility to be able to, you know, spend time with your family, walk your kids to school, pick them up, all of that sort of thing, all the things that are quite, they're not going to last forever. So trying to be enjoying the moments now. Yeah. So, yeah. So have a, so. To answer your question, um, lifestyle entrepreneur to me is having the businesses work for me, not me working for the businesses. Because when you know you see a lot of entrepreneurs wanting to expand their businesses and grow and grow and grow, but for me that wouldn't work because the cost of that is time or health or family, and they're the yeah. things that they're the things that are most important to me. Yeah, and I can so relate to that and I feel you. I've yeah, I've never wanted to kind of be the sl- a slave to the business. And what I'm hearing here is this story of you going from one extreme where you burnt yourself out. And you know what? It's such a great reminder because a lot of entrepreneurs think, you know what, I'm gonna work my ass off until I build it so much and I'm gonna sell and then I can just sit and relax. And then what you've done is you've shown us what what, what life is like on the other side when you basically do nothing. So what would be um, some advice you would give to someone who, you know, at the moment they, they feel, because you know, when I say they feel, it's, I feel like it's a perspective sometimes when they feel like, no, I have to be in there. I have to be the one doing it and the business needs me and just wait, wait until one day I will be able to kind of, you know, sell it or something. So what advice would you give to someone, um, you know, in that boat right now? Um, well, I, th- I think the first thing is you've got to identify what you're good at and what you're not good at and anything that you're not good at, you should be finding someone who's an expert in that area and, um, working with that person. Um, the next thing I would say is that like, I'm really big about working with people that you respect, because if you don't have that level of respect for people that you're delegating to, it's not going to, it's not going to be a viable long-term relationship. So like all all the people um, that I've worked with that we've had past successes with, I always go back to because there's like an energy where you get them and they get you and you know you work uh, well together as a team. Um, And then the other thing is uh, try and introduce automation into your business wherever you can. So like I use uh, Zapier. Mm -hmm. I love Um, that too. I mean, I don't, my team does. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, it's, I think each week it, it automates like 1,400 tasks, 1,400, 1,500 tasks in the three businesses. So I'm like, God, thank God I don't have to do that. You would go crazy, wouldn't you? Mm. And it also, it also um, 
automation helps you grow your business because it's on, it's on autopilot and it's doing all the stuff that you could not possibly remember to do. That's awesome. And so, you know, I just wanted to go back to, um, you know, us joining EO together here. Um, I would love to for you to share a little bit about, I guess, um, you know, one of your top favorite thing about being part of EO and, you know, how has it also benefited you in overcoming more problems along the, um, you know, in recent years for you? Well, for me, the biggest thing with EO is community. So connection and community. So that's why I keep coming back. I've been a member since, so it'd be ninth year this year. Um, but yeah, just that sense of belonging. Um, you've got a lot of individuals that are in, you know, we're all a bit quirky in our own way. So, um, and I think a lot of EO members get each other, you know, so um, understand that understanding the challenges, all the stereotypical stuff, like it's, you know, it can be pretty lonely at the top and um, I remember before I joined EO, I felt a bit, um, particularly in that first business when I had the translation agency in my 20s, I felt quite isolated um, because I didn't have a community of people around me that were in a similar situation. All my mates just worked for other people and I was one of the only people that had my own business and I was working long hours. So yeah, it was a bit isolating. Whereas since I've joined EO, I just feel yeah, I'm. All, I feel connected, you know. So it's it's um yeah, that you know, having a community, uh, you know, it really does make you happy. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I've just joined it, uh, you know, eight months ago, and I'm really, really enjoying it as well. Um, so you know, I'm just curious now, just to wrap things up. It's like I know that we've learned a lesson here that don't retire too young, right? <laughs> uh, we need to kind of build a business and and you know and have something to do. But when will you retire? Like, have you got a number in mind where you're like, you know, I'm ready to accept not doing anything and actually just relax? Uh, no, I don't know if I ever will, to be honest. Like, I've been going through this over the summer holidays about, you know, if I um, sold my health and safety businesses, what that would look like, what the number would mean. And I just, I, I'm not actually quite sure because it's very hard to, like, you get a pot of cash. Um, but you're never going to be able to replace the returns that, you know, I get off the businesses. So I don't know. We'll just wait and see what happens. Like that's pretty much been all the businesses I've started have kind of just, they've never really been this grand scheme or strategy. They've just kind of landed. They've just happened. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm open to, potentially I am open to selling if if um, the health and safety businesses, if someone made a ridiculous offer but equally I'm happy to keep going and my kids are still young so like my youngest is nine so again what do you do for the next 10 years I don't know I think I'd be at a bit of a uh, loose end yeah, yeah. And, and and it's not like I'm stressed or mm. you know what I mean like I, yeah. I think businesses are working for me not me working for them so pretty good lifestyle I don't know if I want to get <laughs> It's just a way of living. And yeah, I really yeah. like the approach where I feel like you're kind of intuitive, feeling how you're feeling. If it feels right, you keep going. If it doesn't feel right, you kind of pivot. And so I love that sometimes entrepreneurs, we think we need to have a 10 year plan and we stick to a business plan and kind of nothing kind of goes to plan anyway. And so I like that you are adaptable to your life circumstances. What, what I am committed to, Lynn, is to sort of optimizing the business businesses all of the businesses to their greatest potential and then when you're in that position you've got options right so if they're all running smoothly and making lots of money and you can either sell or keep them but either or is good mm. well thank you so much Brendan and I usually like to also uh, leave kind of like the one last um, inspirational thing at the end which is I always like to ask people like what do you want the world to remember Brendan for Ah, you've sprung this on me, Lynn. <laughs> um, I think uh, as someone that um, just went for it, you know, like reached their full potential and there wasn't anything that um, they wanted to do that they didn't they didn't go for it. Love it. Well, you definitely yeah. have shown it in the story. Well, um, if you want to contact or connect with Brendan, we've got all of his details in the description below um, on our YouTube channel. And of course, Brendan Tarasi is all over LinkedIn, et cetera, so you can connect with him. So thank you so much for your time today, Brendan. 
Thanks, Lynn. That was great. It's fun.